So good morning. Thank you for joining us for the presentation on I wasn't selected for the HPB lottery. Now what? This webinar is being recorded and the recording link will be emailed to all attendees. This webinar is provided as an educational service by Alcorn Immigration Law. The information discussed by our panel is an overview only and should not be construed as legal advice or advice to take any specific action. Please be sure to consult a knowledgeable professional with assistance with your particular legal issue. Uh, lastly, please submit any questions you may have by using the Q&A function. The questions do get shared publicly, so please do not share any sensitive or personal information. There is an option to submit your questions anonymously, though. Um, we will try to get to as many questions as time permits. And it is uh, my pleasure to introduce to you our founding attorney, Sophie Alcorn, and associate attorney, Nadia Saidi. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Edith. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. And just so you know, you will be receiving access to a recording of this webinar as well as follow-up materials that Edith will be sending out. So welcome to, I wasn't selected in the H-1B lottery, now what? Uh, we have a lot to cover today and this type of content usually leads to many questions. So we're excited to receive your questions and answer them using the question and answer panel. Uh, we are slotted to spend an hour together and we will do our best to answer all of your questions. So my name is Sophie Alcorn. I'm the uh, person behind the TechCrunch Dear Sophie Immigration Advice column along with my wonderful team, founder of Alcorn Immigration Law, host of the podcast Immigration Law for Tech Startups. I'm a certified specialist in United States immigration and nationality law. And really what I do is, you know, people from all over the world want to come to Silicon Valley and to the United States to start tech companies and create new ideas and inventions. And they're met with a lot of paperwork and resistance and obstacles along the way. And many give up. And so what, what I do and what we do is we help, um, we're basically Sherpas for immigrants and we help guide you through every hill and valley so that you can have your American dream of freedom, of prosperity, of security, whatever that means for you. And we are really guided by the vision of a world where everybody has the chance to succeed and follow their dreams, regardless of those little political lines drawn on maps that are the borders between countries. So that's what I stand for. And uh, that's how I founded Alcorn Immigration Law. And that is, I think, one of the reasons that my wonderful colleague, Nadia Zaidi, was attracted to join our firm. She's a Forbes top startup immigration attorney in the United States and has practiced extensively and is a proud first generation American. And Nadia, I'd love to ask you right here, um, what attracts you to practicing immigration? I think just hearing different people's stories of what they want to accomplish, their innovative ideas, their creative pursuits, and, and being part of making it possible is very exciting for me. Yeah, it's, it's really wonderful to, it's super inspiring and super exciting, and it, it's so rewarding um, every time we help somebody get a visa or a green card. So thank you so much, Nadia. We have a lot to share with everybody today. Um, oh, wow, this slide got changed, Edith, because our team grew. So that's exciting. Um, this is who is behind the scenes at Alcorn Immigration Law. When you work with us, uh, we are all, you know, first generation immigrants or immigrants or married to immigrants or just we attract people for whom this is deeply personal in some way. So it's more than a job for all of us. And um, we're delighted to be here with you. Uh, 
we've been really successful even during the Trump administration. We grew a lot. We've had a really high success rate compared to the national average. Um, our RFE request for evidence rate is a lot lower than the national average. So we're really proud of our successes and also just really proud that um, this proves that our model, which is based on uh, compassion and communication, um, it's wonderful to see that those things win in the final tally. Uh, we're part of a vast network of um, investors and incubators and people in the technology ecosystem. So we're here to support our clients with introductions to investors and um, different media opportunities as they arise, which can be really helpful to people in startups. And we're really, we're really proud of our network. Um, I recently became a mentor with 500 startups, which is uh, pretty, pretty exciting. And okay, so now we are going to dive in and I'll provide a, an overview of uh, just to locate all of us in where we are in the immigration context of the aftermath of the H-1B lottery. And then we'll talk about some specific options to help you and then we'll be answering your questions. All right, so the H-1B is a visa. It's non-immigrant. Many people hope to get it because then they hope that a company will sponsor them for a green card. And then they hope that one day they can apply for citizenship. Now, you don't need a visa to get a green card. So if you didn't get an H-1B, we're gonna talk about how you might be able to get another type of visa or another way of getting an H-1B so that you do have a visa. And we're also going to talk about how you might be able to just directly go to the green card process. So that's going to be the focus of today's webinar. And many of you may have come to the United States and you're here already and your journey has been that of international students. Um, most of the 1 million international students in the US are on F1 status, a student visa. Many of you have gotten curricular practical training for summer internships or job experience during a degree program. Uh, many of you have availed yourself of pre-completion or post-completion OPT. If it's after you graduate, it's up for up to 12 months. Um, after that, those of you who are in STEM fields may qualify for the two-year F1 OPT STEM extension. Um, something good to know is that there are, uh, we're not going to talk about this too much in the webinar, so I'll mention it here. Many people whose STEM OPT is running out end up going back for another master's degree program to get CPT. So that's an option. There are also many MBA programs with that have added data science components to their curriculum so that their graduates can qualify for STEM OPT. So if you want to get an MBA and you're on F1 and you're an immigrant, try to find an MBA that offers the STEM OPT option so you have two more years of work after you graduate. And the H1B lottery just happens, so that's here. So this is the step of the standard journey that we'll be dissecting today. <clears throat> and then after the, um, you know, and then the next step for many is to go through the green card process, which often includes the PERM, the I-140, and then an adjustment of status, depending on priority dates. So we'll be breaking that down and talking about alternatives today. Um, and we'll, we may touch a little bit on citizenship. So, <clears throat> Also part of the overview, we're going to be focusing on business-based green card pathways today, but just know that family immigration pathways are an option and the diversity visa lottery is also an option. So if you're in love with a U.S. citizen, uh, we can help you get a marriage-based green card for uh, bona fide good faith marriages. And if you're not from India or China and you're from a country with low levels of immigration, you can always put yourself in the annual diversity visa lottery. Okay, so what if you weren't selected? Nadia, is there hope? Are there any possibilities? Is there anything anybody can do? There are, there are possibilities. 
Okay. If you want to collect it. Great. All right. And we can go through what they are. Let's do it. All right. Can you walk us through this new, it's not a new concept, but it's gaining in popularity. Can you talk to us about what is, what the heck is a cap exempt H1B? So a cap exempt H1B is an H1B that does not need to go through the lottery. So you can be sponsored any time of the year. You don't need to wait until that one time of the year and be put in a lottery, but the institution sponsoring you has to qualify for this cap exempt H1B. So if it is a university or nonprofit association that is affiliated with a government research um, arm, then it could possibly qualify. So we would have to see if, if the institution would mm -hmm. fall in that category. Okay. So do you have to go through the lottery to get one of these? You do not. That's okay. the goal. That's mm -hmm. amazing. And um, what if, you, you know, it's not March or April anymore. So is this still available? Yes, it is. So if you, if you are working for a university or nonprofit research association, or you're working on a project that is affiliated with a government research program, um, then this is something that you might want to look into. Yeah. And can you walk us through, like, do you end up having one H1B that works, that allows you to work at two organizations or what, like practically, what do you end up with? So you could have two H1Bs. So you could have two H1Bs at the same time, which is called mm -hmm. concurrent H1Bs. And one of them would be cap exempt. Okay. And then and currently have one that's subject to the cap. That's not subject to the that's cap. That's not subject to the cap. So. Okay. So basically you get your first H-1B through a nonprofit or university or something. It doesn't have to be full time. And then your, your private company employer can piggyback on a second H-1B. So you have two different H-1Bs that both operate at the same time. That is correct. Yes. Okay. And does this have the typical, you know, up to three year period and normally up to six year maximum that a normal H-1B would have? Yes, it does. Okay. 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 And um, what do you, like, what if you don't know of a research institution that would immediately hire you? what is a practical way for you to find a way to do this now? Like what if somebody's OP, STEM OPT is gonna end on July 30th and they're, they didn't get selected for the third time in the lottery and they're working for a tech company and they're a software engineer. Is there anything they can do to utilize this in the short term if they don't have university connections? Yes, so there is something called a global talent fellowship with um, a foundation called Open Avenues Foundation. And what they do is they provide sponsorship for the CAP exempt H-1B for individuals in STEM degree programs that can serve as global talent fellows and teach um, students from underrepresented represented school districts or areas about their STEM fields. And then a private company can piggyback off of that cap exempt H-1B mm. and sponsor a concurrent H-1B. They, they only have to spend, I believe, five hours mm -hmm. a week on this global talent fellowship program. And then they can work for that private concurrent H-1B company for the rest of their time. So exciting. Mm -hmm. So how does somebody become a global talent fellow? You would need to be in a STEM field mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then Open Avenues Foundation would let us know if they have spots for that mm -hmm. specific area. So perhaps they have some spots for software developers or computer scientists that yeah. they want to fill and then yeah. they would evaluate it and see if they can sponsor the H1B. Cool. Yeah, I actually have some data on this that I got from Open Avenues yesterday. So it's very current. 
Um, they will accept company nominations for uh, especially software developers and computer scientists right now. I believe they also have some spots for people in biotech. So that means, so, so if you're working for a company and they want to keep you here on H1B and they want to do this program, uh, they need to nominate you as a global talent fellow to open avenues. So if you want to contact us, we can put you all in touch. Um, the latest stats I have are that Open Avenues currently has, as of you know the date of this webinar, May 6, 2021, uh, they have three spots for software developers and six spots for computer scientists or data scientists right now with their existing university partnerships. Um, I believe also some for people in biotech. So you want to jump on that. And then the other guidance I got, you know, because they're trying to expand their program, this is a really wonderful opportunity, but these university partnerships can take a lot of um, just time to develop the relationships. So if you're in a different field or uh, they run out of these spots before you talk to them, another really great way to take advantage of this opportunity is if you have a university that you already have a relationship with that would be willing to sign a brand new affiliation agreement with Open Avenues. Uh, you can proactively, you and your company can come forward to Open Avenues with and offer that university relationship. Uh, and it doesn't have to be in STEM if you have a university willing to sponsor you. They're open to creating university affiliations in other fields. It's just what they are currently scaling is the STEM opportunities. So yeah, it's exciting. I love this option. We've gotten several approved for people now and we even got one approved for somebody in India recently who was able to get a consular interview for the five hour a week Open Avenues H1B. It got approved and now he's working on coming to the United States. As soon as he gets here, we're gonna do the second concurrent H1B on behalf of the tech startup that sponsored him and he'll be able to work full time. So it's just super, super, super exciting. Um, if there's one good thing for immigration that came out of the last four years of the prior administration, it's the like necessity being the mother of invention sort of thing that led to opportunities like this being scaled. Mm -hmm. It's a great plan B. Um, Nadia, we got a question in our question and answer panel from somebody wanting to know about if you want to work directly for a university to be cap exempt what are the university requirements um can can you talk about that yeah sure so in order to qualify it, it can't be just any um university uh position it, it does okay. need to be an institute of higher education that's related to or affiliated with a research um, program. Yeah. So, Somebody wanted to know if it has to be accredited. And I don't remember seeing something in the regulations about accredited, but it does have to be related to research, right? Exactly. That's okay. right. All right. Great. Cool. So that's cap exempt H1Bs. Uh, let's go to our next topic. Let's talk about various visa alternatives. There are a lot. Uh, we're going to talk about these in more detail. Um, but for this slide, I just want everybody to know that, that Edith will be sending this chart to everybody that covers some of the most common and effective visa options for Silicon Valley. It is not exhaustive. Like this infographic does not have J1s or TNs because they don't work for everybody. But um, Lots of options. I, I think the ones I want to mention here that we're not going to otherwise explicitly cover, but if you qualify, you really need to look into it more. If you're a citizen of Canada or Mexico and you didn't get accepted for an H-1B, check out the TN. If you're a citizen of Chile or Singapore, check out the H-1B one. And if you're a citizen of Australia, check out the E3 because those are all great backup options. Usually citizens of those countries know they exist, but just in case you didn't know that already, they exist. <laughs> okay, so let's drill down into the first category. And um, can you walk us through what a J-1 exchange program is about, please? Yes, 
So the J1 exchange program is really um, there to offer opportunities for individuals to come and experience working in their field in the United States for short periods of time. So there's J1 interns, there's J1 trainees, and there are J1 researchers. And each of those is really for people that are at different stages of their careers and want to come to the US to sort of learn more and experience what it's like working in that field in the US. Wow. And so they're for different periods of time as well, based on what, what level they're at. What if you're somebody who knows that you absolutely will do whatever it takes to get a green card and your heart is set on living in the United States permanently and you see that you could be a researcher here for five years, could you qualify for a J-1 if your intention is to live here permanently? No. So that's one of the key issues with the J-1 is that it's really an exchange visitor program. So they want, they, the Department of State and your home country government want to see that you're just going to go to the U.S., acquire this amazing knowledge and do this research, and then at some point come back to your home country. So yeah. it's not, it is not a, a viable option if your intention is to immigrate yeah. permanently. And if you've been in the U.S. already on OPT or STEM OPT, the odds of getting a J-1 transfer approved or the odds of being able to qualify for a J-1 at a consular interview are pretty low, mm -hmm. frankly, because they're going to assume that you want to live here permanently. Mm -hmm. But if you're currently in another country and your H-1B didn't get accepted, and you're okay with just coming to the US for one of these time periods, this is definitely worth exploring with your employer, but just know that they're gonna be in a position where they're not supposed to sponsor you for future H-1Bs or green cards if you come on one of these routes. But if you're in research and you wanna work for a Silicon Valley company for five years, it's a great way to do it. And uh, Nadia, this is part of one the COVID, we're gonna talk about travel bans later, but this is one of the exceptions, right? Like J1s and F1s are being issued visas right now at consulates and they're not subject to the 15-day um, geographical travel bans that some countries have. So yeah. it's mm -hmm. a good way to actually get to the US right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now actually this ties into one of the questions from our audience. So we'll be answering that from the question and answer panel. Uh, let's talk about two of the types of e-visas. Oh, <laughs> Edith, we got to take out this part about Belgians. There's a lot of people who qualify for this type of visa beyond Belgians. I just did a program for Belgian people recently. Um, so this is for trade and investment. Can you give us an overview of what the E1 visa is, please? Yeah, so the E1 and E2 are a, it's a type of visa that, that was created for, um, for citizens of countries with which the United States has a treaty of trade. Right. Does India have a treaty for this? It does not. Does China have a treaty for this? It does not, unfortunately. Okay, all right. Okay, let's just get that out of the way. <laughs> yeah. But for everybody else, there's a variety of treaties. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the countries I always think of, people who do this a lot, are people from Western Europe, Japan, Australia. Recently, New Zealand and Israel got connected with these programs. Iran has a really old treaty, but under Trump, they stopped letting in Iranians because of the Muslim travel ban, but hopefully that's ending soon. So that should be available again. Um, do you right. see other countries that use this frequently? Um, I know Pakistan has one. Yeah. Um, uh, Egypt has yeah. it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Some oh. South American countries have it as well. There's also a lot of Brazilians who are dual citizens with Italy, so they end up doing it through their Italian passports. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so what's an E1 about? So E1 is about trade. So if okay. there, so if if a citizen from one of these treaty countries would like to start a company here in the U.S. and there is ongoing trade between the home country company and the United States company, then they might qualify for an E-1. 
So there, there is a back and forth of goods and services that needs to happen in that mm -hmm. scenario. Mm -hmm. So like in this Belgian example, we want to show that there's trade between the US and Belgium. So like chocolate is going, chocolate and beer are going from Belgium into the United States, for example. Exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Got yes. it. it so like if start. it's a, if it's Belgian people with a US tech startup that have a platform to distribute chocolate worldwide, but they're not really getting it from Belgium. So they're just calling it Belgian. That's probably not going to count, right? Because what they actually want to see is stuff going between the US and Belgium directly, right? That's right. And they want to see it like a continuous flow, numerous transactions over time. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, what if it's a company that has a global audience um, and not just in this example, Belgium specifically, what is the E2 about? So the E2 is about investment. So if you are going to make a substantial financial investment into an existing U.S. company or a new U.S. company, then you could qualify for an E2. So we have on there a, on this slide, a amount that is recommended. Yeah. The regulations don't actually say what that number should be. They just say substantial. But we have seen that if it's if it's an investment of between 100 to 200 thousand U.S. dollars, then you're in a very good zone mm -hmm. for the two. But we have been successful um, with the lower investment. It really depends on the type of business. If you're putting up a factory, um, then obviously you need much more money to get that going. Whereas if you're starting a consulting company, then um, you know you need much less. But but yeah, yeah. this is the, the zone that the consulates love to see. And there's also this like relativity thing where if it's like a million dollar company, maybe putting in 200K could be enough to get started. But if the company only requires 50K to start up, then you might need to overcapitalize and still invest 75K to show you're really committed. So the more the company is set up and operational and doing business in the U.S. and has U.S. employees before you file for the visa, the stronger this will be. And That's can you talk about the e-visas for essential employees? Because those are really cool, too. Yeah. So once you've set up your company in the U.S., so, you know, say you are um, a E2 um investor and you've set up your US company and the com so when when you when you file for that initial E2 application at the consulate abroad your company gets registered as an E2 entity and you get your E2 visa and you come and you start working and you're growing your company and then you want to hire a couple more people from your your treaty home country to come and work on you know whatever roles that you need to be filled so we can do an E2 for essential workers um, essential employees of the E2 company, we just have to show that their background and experience matches the role that you're looking to fill and yeah. they're from the same country. So in this Belgian, hy Belgium hypothetical, it would mean that if you want to hire a new software engineer from Belgium, who's never worked for your company before, never had an H1B, but the Belgian investor got an E2 visa, you can bring over as many essential Belgian people as you want, which is yep. pretty cool. Um, okay, great. And we got a question. Oh, and just the flip side of that is, let's say you're a Belgian person in the US um, on STEM OPT and your H1B just got denied uh, through, I don't know, the Belgian Chamber of Commerce or something, you could actually try to get referrals to what companies are Belgian owned and E1 or E2 qualified and apply for jobs there. And then they could potentially sponsor you as well. That's, so that's right. the other way to reverse engineer this. So we did get a question about the E1 from our audience. Um, what do you have to trade? Does it have to be chocolate and physical goods or could it be something intangible like services or they want to know, can you do trading on the equities market? So it can be goods or services. It could be international banking, insurance, transportation. It could be tourism, technology transfer. 
Um, there's even certain news gathering activities that could be traded. So, so it is a number of, of um, things that you could trade. Wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, let's move on. Let's keep going forward to our next option. So uh, what if you want to work for this Belgian, Belgian company as an employee, but you're not a Belgian citizen? What if you're an Estonian citizen and you've been working for the Belgian company in Belgium? Can you come to the US? So that is our L1. Uh, what is an L1 visa about? The L1 is the intra-company transferee. So okay. if you're working for a subsidiary, branch, office, parent company, and there is a U.S. Um, branch, office, subsidiary, then and, and you have been working for at least one year for the mm -hmm. foreign mm -hmm. employer, then you can possibly transfer to the U.S. office of that same company. Let's talk about how this plays out for our specific audience of folks who didn't get the H-1B. So if you're at a big tech company, this is where like a Google type thing would transfer you to their Switzerland office for a year and then bring you back to the U.S. after. What if you're working for an early stage tech startup that ha just has some remote contractors in other countries but doesn't have a foreign office set up? what would the company need to do to take advantage of this? Set up the foreign office. So set it up, um, get it going, and have you work there for at least a year. And then after a year, transfer you back to the U.S. office. Yeah, because it's probably not going to work if you're a contractor getting paid and filing your own taxes in another country, right? Right, because one of the, the key pieces of evidence for this is those 12 months of pay stubs. So okay. with okay. the contractors, it can be yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we also have to show the org chart of the foreign company. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, cool. And so this is a delicate thing for um, startups as it requires them to make some decisions about the amount of liability they want to have in other countries, whether they want to be taxed there. So it's more usually than just the conversation about hiring one person. But for companies that know they're going to grow, like we're talking to somebody that's raising their Series B and they're like, hey, we need a Caribbean office, we need a Canadian office, we need a new US office, like let's just get this going. So for the right company, it's like part of their growth plan anyway and, and easy. Yeah. Um, we did get a question in our question and answer panel about countries. Does the L1 visa have any restrictions as to what country you can be from? It does not. It's, it's more about the qualifying relationship between the offices in the countries that you're in. So it does not. It could be uh, Azerbaijan or China, doesn't matter. And you don't have to have the same citizenship. Like if you're on a work, if you're, if you're from Zimbabwe and you're on a work visa in Dubai, that's cool if you've yep. been working for that Dubai company for a year. Yeah, yeah. The L1 okay. is more focused on your role. So it's, yeah. it's either the L1A, which is manager executives, or L1B, which is specialized knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the focus here is more on what is your title and position? What tasks do you do? How many people do you manage if it's the L1A? And things like that versus mm -hmm. your citizenship. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then another thing to know about this, um, OK, for the Zimbabwe Dubai hypothetical, what if now they've set up a Dubai office, you're on a work visa there, you're working there. What if you have to take business trips to New York to come have business meetings on your visitor visa throughout this one year? What happens to the accrual of the one year? So we have to see how long those business trips are for, yeah. as we uh, do to show the continuous one year of employment abroad. Yeah, so basically, it pauses the clock of accruing the one year, but it doesn't reset it. So if you're here for a three month business trip, it's gonna take you three months longer to accrue that one year of employment in That's right. Dubai. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we did get an, um, another question about this. Uh, can my company move me 
to Canada and in one year get me back to the United States. I am on OPT right now. So it depends. Well, if, right? Yeah, if, if they have an entity in Canada that is a parent, friend, affiliate, or office, which, yeah, yeah. yeah which exists already, then maybe. Yeah. yeah. Depends. Um, Canada, if you want to go that route and you're not a Canadian citizen, there are some other options to consider, but they won't set you up for an L1. There are Canadian POs that will hire you and put you into the Canadian visa program if you have a STEM background and get you a working visa there. Um, you know, but then the question is, how do you move back to the United States if there's no Canadian actual office of your current company? So some people just chill in Canada until they get Canadian permanent residence and Canadian citizenship and then come back to the US on a TN visa one day. That's a really long route. Um, you know, so, but if, but if that interests your company, we have some partners who do that for Canada and we, we're happy to introduce you. Mm -hmm. Great. Now uh, let's turn our attention towards the extraordinary visas. So who, is qualified to get a visa for being in the top of their field. What is this whole visa system for O visas? Yes, this is one of my favorites. Um, so the O1 is for individuals of extraordinary ability um, in various fields. So it could be business, science, athletics, which is O1A, and it could also be artists. Um, and people that work in, in performing arts and whatnot for the O1B. Um, and so you have to prove that you have reached a certain level of acclaim in your field. And we do that through proving three of the 10 criteria that the government has laid out for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some of the types of things that people end up showing if they're academic researchers or people who got PhDs? Yes, so for PhDs, we usually have a lot of um, publications and citations. They've presented at a number of conferences. Sometimes they even have patents or research that they've done that has broader implications in their field. Mm -hmm. Other experts in their field submit letters on their behalf explaining their work. Um, press, if, if they've been part of a project that's been written about in their in trade journals, websites, blogs, newspapers. So those are some of the key pieces of evidence. Cool. So what if you feel like a failure because you didn't do any of that and you actually dropped out of college and you've just like done different startups for the last many years? It could still work. We, we would have <laughs> to look at, we would have to look because for the old one, there's no um, educational requirement. Okay, there's so you don't have to be some brilliant PhD postdoc person with a thousand citations to qualify. No, we've done we've we've done and we do O one A's for entrepreneurs all the time. And what are some of the typical types of evidence that startup founders end up having? So sometimes they have a lot of um, media. So they they're they're they've been interviewed or their work has been featured in a number of of publications. They are part of different um, incubator programs that are very exclusive. Um, the key is things that require a certain level of, of um, acclaim to be part mm -hmm. of. So if you're a member of an association which only chooses certain people from your field, um, so startup founders are often part of mem members of entrepreneurial associations. They might be on panels where they're judging and choosing other startups to be part of, mm -hmm. of certain incubator programs. They might be speaking at conferences, being invited to do that all the time. They might be writing, they might be publishing on, and it doesn't have to be publishing in the New York Times, but they might be publishing articles on, um, I don't know, like Forbes or smaller industry mm -hmm. websites that are widely circulated. So there's a number of, of ways that, that we do this. Um, okay. And, and um, there's also this whole way of doing it for artists and I typically think of people in Hollywood or Grammy award winning artists. Um, but we use the artist version for UX UI designers and graphic designers at tech companies. Um, how do those people typically show their portfolios. 
Yeah, so for them, we it's a literal portfolio of, of all of the different things that they've designed and worked on and been a part of. And then background information about the wider implicate. You know, you could be a UX designer that worked on um, an app that every that's on everybody's phone. And maybe you're not named as the person that created it, but you were a critical part of that project. So letters from your your colleagues as well as showing um, you know, your portfolio of, of what it is that you contributed to that yeah. program design. Wonderful. Cool. Yeah. And we got a really interesting question from the audience about would pastors or priests qualify for this? Um, the O1 is for people who are in the sciences, education, business, or athletics, and there are separate religious worker visas that the pastor or priest might be eligible for. But that being said, if the pastor or priest has expertise in religious education or um, nonprofit administration of a re religious organization, uh, those, you know, we could try to build out the, the arguments that they would qualify for an O1. So it is possible. It's very, very flexible. Yeah. Um, and we got another question about the O as well as the E. And this is, do you have to be in the US when you prepare the petition? And how do you actually go pick up, like, can you explain the difference between a change of status and consular processing, please? Yes, so if you're in the, the US on F1 OPT status, and you're here right now, then, and you're applying for the O1 or E2, and you want to just stay put here in the US throughout this process, then either of these petitions can be filed as a change of status and you would not need to leave um, in order to do that. If you are abroad or if you plan to go abroad, then the, the petition can be filed as consular processing. And what that means is you will get your visa stamp at the consulate abroad yeah. and come back into the US in that sense. And so you could be in the US wrapping up your, your STEM OPT and choose consular processing. And so file when you're here, but then leave to go get the visa. We kind of don't recommend that in COVID because it could be hard to get back in. Exactly. Um, and just if you do the change of status route, then the thing to remember is the next time you travel internationally, you're gonna need a new visa to come back in. So you might get stalled on your vacation if you're waiting for a visa interview. So you exactly. might wanna focus on the US National Park Tour instead of the Caribbean cruise. So <laughs> great. Okay. Um, okay, cool. And then, um, you know, if you're interested in uh, seeing if you qualify, we do have a questionnaire that um, Edith can send you so you can follow up to our uh, materials that she'll be sending out. We can assess your qualifications. Um, we often discuss that in a paid consultation. But one of the things that we most often recommend to our clients who don't yet qualify is we have a course called Extraordinary Ability Bootcamp, a 15 module e-learning class where I have many videos, 15 videos, uh, going into the details of how to bolster your portfolio of accomplishments to qualify for an 01 or some of the related green card types. Um, you'll get a discount code for that if you would like to sign up. All right. And the last thing I wanted to briefly mention is because uh, some of our folks are in startups. Um, we are currently testing out this program on uh, four or five startups we have selected. Real briefly, this type of uh, immigration program would be for people who have a, a company that's less than five years old. They have at least 15% equity. They want to be the CEO or some other um, chief uh, executive role in uh, C CTO, COO, CPO, CMO, whatever, um, some sort of leadership role in the startup. Um, and you must have raised at least $250,000 from a US investor or a $100,000 government award. It will give you 30 months of parole status to live and work in the United States. Your spouse can get a work permit. You can renew it for another 30 months. Obama created it, Trump tried to kill it, but he didn't. So it's actually on life support. So now we're trying to resuscitate it. <laughs> so um, we selected out of like 40 or 50 applications, the top five, we're helping those people get this now. We're going to prove that it works. And then we're going to accept more clients for this in the future. So we're not actively accepting more cases for this. 
um, that if um, you know, you'll be hearing in our newsletter and our materials if this is something that we can expand to more companies in the future. Um, all right. So now let's talk about green cards. I know we had a question about that. Will we be talking about EB2 and EB3? And yes, we'll also be talking about EB1. And here is the slide for that. So um, Nadia, can... Is this, is this teeny part of the conversation relevant for people who've never been sponsored and who were born in India and China and who are single? Can they get a green card really quickly? Um, maybe. The uh, probably not. <laughs> but maybe with, with the priority dates moving. Exactly. And maybe one. One, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Okay, can you just give us the two minute overview of green cards, please? Yes, so green card, these are employer, or employment-based green card routes. And a number of them require an employer to sponsor you, but the EB1A Extraordinary Ability and the EB, EB2 National Interest Waiver, you could sponsor yourself for those two options. Um, for the rest of the options here, the EB2 and the EB3, you do need your employer to sponsor you and you go through the labor certification process and the I-140 process. And you, you generally need to be in another status like H-1B or something else, which allows you to continue working while this is all happening. Mm -hmm. so, D does your spot in line depend on your current country of citizenship or your country of birth? Country of birth. Great. And um, what is happening with the visa bulletin right now, which tells the wait times for people from different countries? Yeah, so the visa bulletin every month tells us what, what is happening and what's, how are the lines, the virtual lines moving. And it seems to be moving in the right direction. Um, for many of these categories, the EB1 especially is, is current right now for everybody. So that Including means India and China. Yes. Yeah. So it's kind of amazing. Like most of the green cards are distributed at consulates around the world. And that was all canceled last year. And there's a law that rolls all of the unused family green cards from every country and every category that weren't used in 2020 for the pandemic into the employment-based categories in 2021. So there's rapid forward movement in the coming months. So if you can do an EB1 from India or China, you might actually have a chance to file your adjustment of status pretty soon. Um, and it's just really good news. Um, somebody wants to know if there's, uh, how, if you didn't get an H, I don't, I'm going to rephrase this slightly, but like, do you really need an H1B if you can get an EB2 or EB3 and maintain your status? Like what are the pros and cons of a green card versus an H1B? So the, the H1B allows you to work as soon as if you make it through the lottery and if it's approved then October 1st you can begin working for your employer um, if it's if you're being sponsored for a green card through the EB2 or EB3 routes then your employer will need to test the labor market prove to the Department of Labor there's no qualified U.S. workers and that whole process leading up to the immigrant visa petition filing can take some time it can yeah a year so, or more. So it's slower and we usually recommend that you maintain a non-immigrant status in parallel right but exactly. if you can file the i-485 green card application then maybe you can just get a work permit and rely on that but then if it gets denied eventually then you have to leave the country if you don't have an underlying h1b so it's best to have both exactly um, <laughs> <laughs> but we do know of some tech companies that are like just throwing paint at the wall and seeing what sticks and trying all options and yeah so lots of possibilities yes okay. we're gonna i'm gonna blaze through the slides so that we can get to some other questions that we have before right. the end uh eb5 people aren't really using it but you can if you want to but it's going to take a really long time minimum investment is 900k uh, it needs to be your own money. You got to hire 10 people um, or create 10 jobs and it gives you a two-year green card. 
a lot of people are using the L1 structure instead these days. Uh, if you are in love with a US citizen and it's a good faith marriage and you're in the US and you're like, well, we could get married, um, that's definitely a conversation you want to have. I know that some people really want to do immigration independently of a spouse and they want to do it based on their own accomplishments. I get it. Um, but if you're in a good, loving relationship and you're confident about it, then this is um, so much easier of a path. And we do have companies that cover the costs of marriage-based green cards for their employees who qualify because it's so much faster and cheaper than the employment-based options. Mm -hmm. um, for citizenship, you basically need to get a green card first and have it for five years or three years if you're married to a citizen. And then you'll qualify if you are here at least half the time, good moral character. Sometimes people are asking us about folks who got stuck outside of the US during COVID who have green cards. We can do consultations for those people based on their individual situation. Um, we did start a nonprofit to support international students. We need volunteers, we need software engineers and grant writers. Uh, we're trying to build an app so that international students can um, connect with attorneys for subsidized legal advice and uh, meet employers who are excited about diversity and hiring internationally. So if you would like to volunteer any skills or expertise or donate, uh, we would love to receive your support. So thank you for considering that. Uh, a few brief notes on what's going on with immigration now because of COVID. Um, if you leave the country, you got to get a, a COVID test to come back in. Um, this is even for US citizens. And I was thinking of going to Mexico and then I realized I didn't want to get stuck outside the country um, because I have kids. So not going to Mexico right now. But uh, get your, to your COVID test with your negative results if you want to come in. Even if you've been vaccinated, you need the negative COVID test still. Uh, based on these proclamations, there are still bans for people who can come in. So if you've been in Shang the Schengen area of Europe, the United Kingdom, China, now India, also Iran and Brazil, within the last 15 days, you cannot come into the US. A lot of our clients have done the Mexican vacation for 15 days prior to entering California. Um, there is, There are some exceptions. They're called national interest exceptions. We are obtaining these for business travelers in the national interest. Um, Europe got strict. They're really only letting in people to work on COVID stuff. They're not letting in other critical people. So we have a workaround through a, spe a specific airport that we're using for some clients. But just know that if you need this exception to travel directly to the US, it's probably going to take two to three months to obtain. So it's hard to get it for imminent travel, but if you want to cut out the Mexican vacation, that's an option. Um, lots of things to consider, mainly your time, uh, your timeline. It's best to be early and proactive with all of these matters because there's a lot of nuances that come up. Our field is changing all the time and we really need to guide each person through individually because it's so tailored. Um, and so, you know, we're excited to chat with you. You're going to be getting this handout once again, um, as well as the recording. And we have a few minutes left for some questions, Nadia. So uh, we'll, we'll just go through those quickly. Okay, cool. So the first one, where can you see the universities that are affiliated with Open Avenues? You can't. So you'll have to contact them through your employer to get more details or just talk to wherever you got your master's degree or your startup advisor, faculty person, you know, you have to figure it out. I'm happy to make introductions to support you. Um, okay, E1 question, Nadia. Does the company need to be incorporated in the treaty country or the US in order to qualify for the E1? So you definitely need to incorporate it in the US to yeah. qualify. And if it's incorporated in the treaty country, then it's easier to show the trade back and forth. Perfect. Okay. And then you could get an L1. And if there's not, if you just have customers in the in the treaty country, that's fine too. Right. Great. Okay. Next, uh, cap exempt H one B. Do you have to get a second concurrent employer, or could you just have a full time job at a, at a cap exempt organization? 
you could have a full-time job at a cap exempt organization. Yeah. Yeah. We just do the concurrent one because often people, you know, actually want to spend most of their time working at a company that doesn't qualify. Uh, okay. Next question. Um, can a company wants to do an employment-based green card for a Canadian employee, typical timeline for like an EB2 or EB3 with PERM, what would you put it at? I would say, is the person outside the U.S.? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say at least a year. Probably two, maybe Probably three. Two years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, what's an EB2 NIW? It is a national interest waiver. It's a person with exceptional ability, master's degree, or 10 years of work experience and, and lots of achievements. Yeah. And their work is in the U.S. as national interest. You'll create jobs. You'll, you'll enhance the U.S. economy in some way. Easier or harder than an EB1A? In some ways, easier. Okay. Yeah. And we cover this in our boot camp class as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question. Uh, if you want to get a green card in the US, do you have to have valid non immigrant status first to go through the adjustment of status process? You have to be in valid status. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you go get a green card? Can you do it? Can you start a green card if you're planning on leaving to go get your L1 time going? You you have to probably not. It doesn't make sense to file an adjustment of status if you're going to be leaving for a year. Yeah, but you could still do a consular processing for your green card. Exactly. That's exactly right. So yeah, it is possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody qualifies for an O1B, can they get an EB1A? Um, maybe the EB1A is a higher bar, so okay. not always, so but it's not automatic. No. Well, looking into okay. Exactly. Um, for the E1 question, it means this person's clarifying you have to have a US entity, and the treaty country entity is optional. Yes, okay. Uh, somebody wants to know about day one CPT. Is it a good stopgap to get more H-1B chances? What type of universities do it? There's a couple of private universities in Kentucky and maybe Virginia that do this. Under the Trump administration, the, the DHS created a fake school to trick students into qualifying and so they could deport them. So just be really careful. We don't have a particular recommendation for any day one CPT programs, but a lot of our clients uh, research it on their own and end up using it. Um, Okay, uh, we've got a question about U visas for victims of, of crimes. Um, that's outside of the scope of the webinar, but if you would like to pay for consultation, we would be happy to support you. Uh, here's a question for um, L1B expires in July, companies willing to apply for an H1, but they want the person to leave the US and return on October 1st, and the person's worried about the travel ban. I would suggest considering a change of status to like a B1 visitor visa to just hang out in the US. You'd have to go off payroll, but you could at least try to stay without leaving. You'd have a, a change of status from L1B to H1, and then you'd have a change of status, or excuse me, L1 to B1, and then B1 to um, H. And you'd probably have to get your B1 filed before the H1B gets filed for the lottery. So that's a, a tricky one that you need to make sure about. Um, any thoughts on automatic visa revalidation program? This is um, I believe certain certain people that have an expired um, visa can get get it automatically revalidated, um, but it's only it only applies for people who left for a short time. Yeah. Um, and okay. yeah, we can share more information about that if you'd like to. Great. All right, cool. Um, and, and in the prior example, the person with B1 already, you know, you would need to get a change of status to B1, which is separate from having a visa in your passport. Um, so definitely consult with an immigration attorney on that. All right, well, we're right on time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Nadia. This was awesome. Uh, we appreciate our attendees. Edith's going to send you all some information. We invite you to um, sign up for paid consultations or take our questionnaires, boot camp, nonprofit, lots of options to get involved. And we just appreciate you for attending. So thank you, Nadia. Thank you. It was lovely speaking to you.
It's always a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.